Hello guys, this is the material for exam number three, uh, exam number, yeah, I think three or four, exam number four, I'm losing it, but that's okay. You all know what I'm talking about. And so this is the material for next exam, the beginning of the material for next exam. And I'm hoping again, just like last exam, to be able to do it in uh, two, three uh, videos, not two, but um, three, sometimes four. So pseudocelomate animals, it means they have false coelom. Pseudo, as you know, means false coelom. Again, this is a diagram that it would be good for you guys to know if you are concerned with classification and knowing a big picture and where things are located as far as classification goes. So it is important. Sometimes I threw a question here and there. So if you like to know more about it, right there. So the next clade, uh, well, this clade that we are going to talk about is a clade ecti sozoa. It means they shed their uh, outer tegaments. Animals that shed a tough external coat, um, um, either exoskeleton or cuticle, in this case, uh, the pseudocelomate animals we are going to talk about, they shed their exoskeleton. Molting, or another name for it is molting or ecdiasis. And there are eight phyla, uh, and nematoda is one of those eight phyla, but we are not going to study. Um, we are not going to study eight phyla of uh, the uh, ecdiasis, but regulation of molting achieved by a hormone uh, ecdiosone. If you are wondering what does ecdiosone means, uh, why the name they got ecdiasis uh, because of this, um, because of the hormone. And then um, what we have: pseudocelomate animals or four or five phyla in the. Uh, pseudocelomate animals. Pseudocelomate animals is just the name of a group of animals. It's not the name of a um, clade or grade or phylum. It's not the name of any of those, okay? It's just a group of animals that they have pseudocelom. I refer to the material from last exam and make sure you know what is the difference between acelomates, pseudocelomates, and eocelom. So we are talking about pseudocelomate. You should know what pseudocelomates are. And then there are four or five phyla in this group. It depends on the textbook you look up. But there are three phyla, which we'll discuss here, the metoda, which is mainly, uh, we refer to them in here. Uh, that the big bulk of uh, pseudocelomates that we're going to discuss are, uh, are nematoda. Rotifera, we'll talk about it a little bit, and I can't accept a very little bit. Uh, and nematomorpha, I only have one PowerPoint thing on it. And then what happens with nematomorpha uh, in the lab, we have some, uh, well, we only have a Paragordius, uh, the horse here, one in the lab. And he has a very interesting life cycle. I wish you guys would um, look it up in YouTube and find out the cockroaches, this worm comes out of the cockroaches. It's very interesting uh, life cycle. If you, can, if you have time, you can go to YouTube and look it up. Okay, uh, then uh, introduction. Uh, so for this phylum, uh, they uh, lack cavity, uh, the peritoneal cavity sac, they lack that. Your protostome animals, you already know, by a bilateral symmetry, well-developed organ. Uh, they're polyphyletic, uh, it means they evolve from different phyla. And their pseudocelum and they're from uh, uh, blastocele, syncytial epidermis, it means, you know, we already talked about it. Uh, one cell has multiple nuclei. <clears throat> they do not have circulatory or respiratory organs, uh, but they have, uh, the nematoda, they do not have protonephilia. But other pseudocelomate animals, they have this uh, structure of protonephilia. Coleca and uh, eggs contain chitin. Okay, coleca is a structure that were reproductive material and digestive uh, system material comes out from. Like the best example of chicken. Some of you are familiar with chicken's egg. Chicken's egg, if you look at it, you know, go take a look at it, there's some poop around it. So chicken have cloaca. The eggs of chicken come out from the same place as their poop comes out. That's called cloaca. 
nematodes do not, the, male, the female do not have cloaca, but the male has cloaca. Okay, so the male cloaca, it is uh, in the male. You tell uh, something we talked about it, I think early on is the name of, um, uh, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to put it on the big screen. Sorry about that. Oh, no, didn't say that. Yeah, no, didn't say that. Okay, so where am I? Cloaca is, uh, utility it means constant number of cells. I don't know if it was, you were exposed to it in bio one or not, but uh, what you tell it means, the organism is born with a set number of the cells and dies with a set number of cells. So that's what the definition of utility is in this case. These organisms, after they go through, you know, L1, L2, L3, L4, they become adult. The number of the cells do not change until they die. In case of us human, the number of the cells in our nervous system in our nervous system and in our skeletal system, the muscles, all of the muscles in your body. You were born with a set number and will die with a set number. That's what uh, utility means. Utility in case of us human is only nervous system and uh, muscular system. Uh, the rest of our cells change. Uh, your bone cells, when you were born, were 100 million. Now you have 1 billion, for example. I'm just making them. I don't know those numbers. Okay, your skin cell, when you were, more, uh, when you were born, you had 100,000, now you have 5 million. So the numbers change, except the number of our neurons and the number of our muscle cells. That's what you tell us. But these organisms, uh, I have a footnote somewhere in here that the, all, the whole organism from head to toe is constant. Complete digestive system except uh, acanthocephala. Acanthocephala do not have a, uh, a digestive system. Food and nutrient is absorbed just like tapeworm. Uh, you remember that food and nutrient is absorbed through their um, tegument, okay? But these guys, you remember we had incomplete digestive system and complete digestive system. They have complete digestive system, means they have a mouth and they have an anus. Other animals, acylomate animals you looked at, it would have a mouth and anus, same place. Okay, so uh, phylum nematoda, the roundworms, the common name for the whole entire phylum is called, called uh, roundworms. About 12,000 known species, and they are, uh, scientists are saying it could be uh, are about 500, half a million uh, species to be discovered. Cyanoraptitis elegans is the most a research organism uh, on planet Earth. They took the, the, the it was the first organism that they they had their genome completely known, and they use it a lot in biochemistry because uh, of the utility. The number of the cells are constant; uh, they do not change, and also uh, they uh, have uh, their DNA has been studied for a long time. So anytime they run the standards in. Uh, Study DNA, they use most likely, they use cyanoraptitis elegans. Easy to grow in the lab, they're very easy. They're free living uh, uh, nematodes. Okay, they are probably one of the free living, or second, the two free living. There are many, many, many free living. You dig up your soil, you go to the pond, you go anywhere, you go to the trees, uh, there are nematodes there. Uh, but uh, we do not emphasize on any of those except the parasitic ones, okay? Uh, so if you dig up your soil, you see a, a little white worm uh, crawling around, swimming around, it's probably a cyanoraptitis elegans or could be anything else. There, there are uh, 12,000 species. They are free living and parasitic, I'll talk about that. Non-living cuticles secreted by hypodermis. Hypodermis is underneath of the um, cuticle, so hypodermis secretes the uh, collagen material uh, right here. Cuticle is made up of collagen, which is outside of the hypodermis. No cilia flagella, longitudinal muscles only. They have longitudinal muscles. I'm talking about nematodes, and they do not have uh, secular muscles. Glycogen, as you're familiar with, is used uh, by their muscle cells to contract uh, for cellular respiration. You know the cellular respiration from before. Okay, the only, the only uh, phylum in animal kingdom, 
the only phylum in animal kingdom that muscles extend to the neuron are these guys, to the axon are nematodes. You remember when we talked about human, when we talked about jellyfish, when we talked about um, nematodes, I'm sorry, not nematodes, uh, acylomates, um, platyhelminthes, it was the neuron would go to the muscle and the muscles contract. You remember that? Same as us, okay? This is the axon knob. They go to the neuron, uh, to the muscle cell. This is muscle cells. My, my left hand is my muscle cells. And then they release uh, neurotransmitters and the muscles uh, will go through contractions, right? You remember that? It is opposite in here. The muscle cells go to neuron and the neuron release, trans, uh, release neurotransmitters and the muscles contract, okay? So it's a neuron, it's a muscle that extends to the neuron, to the accent. Uh, thrashing movement, they move like this, okay? Wave-like, uh, not like your esophagus, you will learn in earthworms move like our esophagus by peristalsis, but they move by thrashing movement. And I will talk about it later on, which comes up. Uh, most are dioecious, it means sexes are separate, male and female. Lab practical exam questions determine the gender. What is, is that a male or female? Uh, copulatory bursa, male have copulatory bursa, which hang on to female and transfer sperm into the female. Okay, so they are, the male have, and the spicules, none of this is penis, okay? Uh, spicules is a structure that open up the vagina and then penis insert uh, into the vagina and release sperm. Okay, and copulatory versa, not all of them have it. You will see hookworms have them. They grab onto female, and then of course, spicules would be, for example, this would be spicules, this would be copulatory versa, and the spicules open up the vagina, and then penis insert the sperm. Okay, fertilization internal, after all of that work, you know, of course, the fertilization is internal. And then they go through four stages of juvenile. L1, L2, L3, L4, some textbook like to say uh, J1, J2, J3, and J4, an adult, okay? So, but here I refer to it as L1, L2, L3, L4, adult, okay? So they go through four stages of juvenile and they molt. During each juvenile stage after the egg, they do molt to become L1, they molt to become L2, they molt to become L3, they molt to become L4. Uh, there are some species that are viviparous, the filarial worms, you, we'll talk about them later. They are viviparous, it means they give birth, okay? Muscles extends the axon, thrashing movement. Okay, um, here we go, I'm explaining uh, thrashing movement um, that skeletal muscles makes the, uh, makes them thinner and straighten up and hydrostatic pressure and cuticle make them curve. So the animal curves, it's because of hydrostatic pressure because they have cuticle outside and the fluid inside of the animal is called hydrostatic pressure. So the hydrostatic pressure uh, and the cuticle make the animal curve. The longitudinal uh, muscles make the animal straight. So they curve, they straight, they curve, they straight, and that's how they move. And that's called thrashing movement, okay? So they are protostome, they're bilateral symmetry. You all know what I mean, bilateral symmetry. You cut the animal from middle and both halves are alike. That's the only way you can cut the animal. Uh, you cannot cut it anyway, just like jellyfish. That would be radial symmetry. Just chiproblastic animals, we've been in tree, uh, the uh, acylomates, the uh, flatworms, uh, platyhelminthes, you remember, they were triploblastic also. These guys are also triploblastic. Okay, let's talk about cross-section of this animal and then uh, we'll get into these. If you, if you, this is the animal right here, if I cut it, in a, uh, if this is the animal, I cut it right here and I'm looking at it this way. So that's what you're looking at, the cross-section of the animal. Uh, let's go from the cuticle right here, the very outer layer, 
And then you have the hypodermis. You see that line right here, that little line that goes around. That's the, you remember we talked about that? That's the line that secretes the cuticle, which is made up of collagen. Okay. So the cuticle actually is a non living material. Okay. And then you have the nerve cord right here. And look at all of these skeletal muscles. They're all coming into nerve cord up there, dorsal and ventral sides. So nerve cord, and then you have the smallest one, our ovary, look like a wheel. A little bit larger is oviduct, and the largest of all is uterus. In the lab practical exam, you should know which one is which. This is, of course, is a female. And then you have the muscles, excretory canals or lateral lines. We, you know, the excretory canals run through the lateral line. This is called lateral line. It's called lateral line. And then the white space here, all of that white space as pseudocelomate, because that space is surrounded by a layer from endoderm and layer from mesoderm. So that space is pseudocelomate. Okay, I think I went over the intestine, I mentioned that. And here they are trying to show you that the muscle cells are extending to the neuron, to the nerve cord. Okay, that's very unusual in animal kingdom. Cuticle, hypodermis makes the cuticle. And then what is the advantages of having space? And that was one of the essay question. Uh, what is advantageous for animals to, instead of um, flatworms? You know, the flatworms, they do not have any space. Everything, the space is filled out with cells from mesoderm. So the animal cannot grow larger and larger and larger, okay? When you have space, as a result, the animal can grow larger and larger and larger, okay? So uh, freedom of movement, of course, they uh, move freer than the other organisms. Space for development, I talked about that. Better circulation of material, either waste material or food material, oxygen, anything. Storage for waste. So having space as a storage. And of course, hydrostatic pressure allows the animal to move as a method of movement. So those are the five advantages that your textbooks talk about it. And I thought I mentioned it here. Uh, so you know what are the advantages. Uh, soon, oh, okay. So the first organism we are gonna study is um, Ascus rumericoides and Ascus soon. So, both of these are found in human and pigs, swine. However, as we assume in human can be dangerous. If the eggs become larval stages in the head, they can cause death in human. So uh, both of these are found in the United States. We in pig farms, you know, they brought a fecal matters of pigs and they had I mean, a, 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 a pigs feces. Uh, ask us soon. It can remain in the environment for a long time. You know, when they open up the mummies from uh, 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, when they open them up, they saw the eggs of these guys in the intestine. I don't know. I don't. I doubt that if those eggs were viable, still they could turn into L1, L2, L3. But the eggs can stay in the environment for a long, long, long time, and that's why in the past we human had a problem with, uh, well, still we have some problems with it, uh, with uh, roundworms. A lot of people had roundworms. So about 15 to uh, 40 centimeters long, they're quite long, they can be this long. Uh, they're not small. Uh, of course, ask us soon. We'll talk about other, other, other species as well, but this is probably the largest one that uh, you're studying for now. Uh, mouse has three lips, and hopefully you will see some pictures. Anus is on the ventral side, and male have spicules on the ventral sides. They do not have copulatory versa. They have spicules. As I talk about that, spicules opens up the vagina, and then the, uh, the uh, penis is inserted in the worm, the female worm, and transfer sperm. But they do not have copulatory versa. You will see copulatory versa later. Of course, they're dioecious. Two sexes are separate, male and female are separate. Female has the Y-shaped reproductive tract. What does it mean, the y shape? So the bed, I'm sorry, my hands, my fingers would be the ovary, 
and then uh, uh, my pond would be the uh, oviduct, and then the oviduct come together, become uterus, becomes one, and then uterus ends up into vagina. And you will see the picture here in a minute. Hang on, I hope it comes up. Uh, thin ovary, larger oviduct, and even larger uterus, and uh, life cycle is direct. It means they don't need any insects. They don't need any snails. They don't need anything, vegetation. Just the egg from one organism, from human or pig, get to human or pig. Of course, the eggs end up in feces, right? Uh, fertilization after copulation. And then here they are. So what I was talking about, this is a cross section of the animals. And then you have the intestines, pseudocelum, uh, excretory canals that runs through lateral line. Make sure during the exam you get it right. And then you have the gut, you have the uh, ejaculatory duct, uh, spicules is right here. So anyhow, what else do I have to say? Here's the life cycle of it based on CDC, male and female. The male uh, is curved. The posterior end of the end of the male is curved, but female is straight, okay? So female is not curved. Again, CDC, draw that by mistake. The eggs are lobed, look at the eggs. You see the lobes on these? So the eggs have lobes both for um, Ascus sum and uh, uh, Ascus rubricoides. Here they are, they're showing you they can be found in intestine, uh, a horrible, whole bunch of them. In old days, uh, we are talking about uh, 100, 200, 300 years ago, um, and, and now on back, everybody had it. Okay. The next roundworm, intestinal roundworm in the intestine, in dogs is toxic keratinus, in cats is toxic keratai, and in wild carnivores it is a tox, uh, toxascarus leonina, and they cause visceral larval migrants. So if by accident we ingest these eggs, the eggs, you remember the eggs, these eggs, I didn't show them to you, um, you know, inside they go through morula, you remember that? After morula, then you have the larva inside, L1, and then after L1, you have L2, and then inside, oh, come on, the eggs, they're supposed to be around, L3, and then uh, you have this worm inside is L4, and then becomes adult. Right, you remember that? So the infective stage for most all of nematodes is L3. If we ingest L3, then we'll become infected with it. If we go back to uh, uh, toxic keratinus and uh, ask us uh, soon, okay? Go back to that one. We have to ingest L3. If we ingest L2, L1, nothing will happen. Okay, so L3 is in, they call it infective stage. Okay, so what happens in case of these worms, uh, Toxicara canis, Toxicara cati, Toxascus leonina, and I will mention one more from raccoon, what will happen if we ingest L3 by accident? So the L3 goes inside of our gut and wandering around and wandering around and wandering around, we do not have the right enzymes, right protein molecules. They wander around and they cannot become L4 an adult, okay? Or they cannot become adult. They become L4 to some extent uh, and then adult they cannot become. And then we feel pain and ache and uh, all the time. So, and it's very hard to diagnose for the clinicians to diagnose, um, they call it visceral larva migrants. Okay, so, uh, and that's what these organisms cause. Here they are, they're showing it to you. We play, kids play with dirt and they put that in their mouth and the egg can have stayed in the brain for a long time. Okay, and they put that in the mouth, the dog poop there. Uh, the sylvatic cycle is the rabbit, between rabbits and dogs, and then what happens. Uh, right here, the three lips, I told you they have three lips right there. And these are all male. All of these are male. All of these are female. Okay. 
came because of the curvature in the posterior end. You can see that. And these are all, and dates are low. So here are severe cases, uh, you know, if a person is infected with them a lot, they can come from the anus like that one, or they can come out from mouth. And there's another one in raccoon, Bayless ascaris, uh, porcinus, um, procinus, sorry about that, procinus. Um, so in the raccoon, nowadays they're gaining territory for whatever reason, the numbers, you know, we're destroying the environment they're coming more. And I'm seeing more raccoon now than I ever saw before in my life. So when they poop and then our kids go in the yard and play, voila, we have a lot of problem with it. Uh, over 120 species of birds and mammals have been killed. Human also infected. Raccoons show no signs of infection. Uh, you know, the roundworms complete the life cycles in raccoons and female lay millions of eggs. I'm talking about female. Uh, Prascus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Prascus, I'm Aspis. Uh, Prascus is for horses. Anyhow, uh, a female lay millions of eggs and cause visceral and ocular, they go to the eye, make the eye blind, and neural normal migrants in host and not raccoon. Here they are, we human again uh, can become infected with. Uh, so I, I'm going to let you read these uh, as long as you know. Uh, it can be treated if it can be diagnosed. Uh, the problem is uh, the doctors uh, have not been treated in this area and they're not sure. Here are fecal matters of the raccoon uh, in the houses. They gain access into the houses and they treat. Okay, the next worm are your um, hookworms. And Celostoma duodenale and Nicator americanus. They both can be found in the United States. Okay, uh, mouth part uh, has teeth or cutting plates. I'll show you some pictures. They are voracious blood suckers. So when they cling on to their small intestine and they cut our intestine with the teeth or uh, the cutting plate, uh, so the blood comes out and they use the oxygen of that blood. They really, really do not intake the, the, um, the blood. They just need the oxygen. And that's why they are, they call them voracious blood suckers. And that's in the feces, you will see blood. That would be an indication of these worms. Uh, Southern states of the United States um, had problem with it. It's better now, still in the rural problems, there is a problem with, um, with the uh, hookworms. Uh, Civil War, they claim, you know, it was lost because they were infected with it. Uh, I don't know how the truth that is, but some books say that mentioned that they lost the Civil War because the soldiers, the men were lethargic, they were tired all the time, and they were infected with uh, uh, hookworms. And Celasa canina, of course, uh, the, it is uh, in the dogs, as you know, uh, but if the, we come across them, then in human, it cause cutaneous larva migrants. So the eggs of these parasites become L1, becomes, and they are not inside of the egg anymore. They are larva like that. Then becomes L2, becomes L3. The L3 is the one, it's found in body of water, lakes, rivers, uh, you know, streams. The L3 penetrate in our skin. You remember the cercaria on last exam, the acylomate animals, they penetrate our skin when we go dipping into the water and then L3 in us becomes L4 adult, not in case of Ancelostoma caninum. In, in case of Ancelostoma caninum, L3 penetrate our skin, I say, wow, this is not dog. It might become L4 and they go around our skin, they wiggle and you can see it. You can, they move very slowly. But they can put one person hydrocortisone on top of them and we kill them and uh, you know, the itching goes away and there's not much problem anymore. Yeah, and you deal with it for 24 hours. It's not as devastating as a visceral larva migrants. They're not that bad. You get rid of 24 hours, okay? So cutaneous larval migrants is we get them from 
uh, ancillostom and carinum of rot. Here's the life cycle. As you can see, the L3 uh, thriller form larva, they call it thriller form larva, penetrate into our skin. And then in our skin, uh, some of these larvae become male, some of them become female. I think I draw them once versa, the other way around. This, this is a male. And this is female. Okay. So, and that's what the egg is. Egg become uh, rapid form larva. Don't worry about that. CDC is putting out here. But film form larva is the one that penetrates. Here are the hooks or, or, or cutting plates right here. And here is a picture of intestine. Here is our intestine right here. And here is the worm clinging on. And then, of course, taking the oxygen from our blood and the rest goes out. Here is copulatory versa. You remember that? We talked about this, the copulatory, but the whole thing, the whole thing is copulatory versa. This thing right here is the spicules. You guys can see that. That thing, the spicules, it opens up, this is a male, of course, opens up the vagina of the female, and then uh, the penis, I cannot find, figure out where is penis. The penis will transfer the sperm of female to the uh, vagina of female. Here's again the real picture of the uh, teeth and the cutting plates are usually like that. Okay, that's what cutting plates are, but these are teeth. Here is a cutaneous larval migrants of the dog. For Ancelosoma du Denali and Nicator Americanus, we do not get the uh, cutaneous larval migrants. Okay, so we do not get the cutaneous larval migrants. They just penetrate in our skin and go find their way into our intestine. Okay, I hope I'm making some sense. It's just the dogs and Celosoma caninum, we find it. Here they are, they are showing you the life cycle again based on your textbook. They penetrate our skin and they go into the intestine and uh, treat themselves uh, with our blood. The next organisms is a trichinellar spiralis. I like to talk about this. Parasite a lot more because it is significant, it is important. Uh, people are dying off of it. Uh, just a lot of take caring of it, but anyhow, you will see, you will see what I mean. Uh, we can take care of this parasite better than how we human are taking care of it right now. Okay, the name of the disease is called trichinosis, trichinella spiralis. And the name of the disease is trichinosis, uh, trichiniasis. You know, there are three or four. If you search it up, you will see there are three or four names of disease for this one. And then what will happen, the epidemiology of it, a, uh, it penetrates skeletal muscle cells and can become a, one of the largest intracellular parasite. So they are inside of our skeletal muscle and they can become very large. You can see it on the microscope nice and neat. Uh, juvenile can redirect gene expression of the host cell, uh, the musculature, uh, where cells lose uh, striation and become a nurse cell uh, to the parasite. So what we are seeing on the microscope, I like to call it nurse cell, the ones we have in the lab. Hogs can become infected when eating uncooked uh, scraps of infected meat or by eating infected rats and, and the pens. This is almost same epidemiology as you learn in case of toxoplasmic garden. The epidemiology in the pigs, and then of course we eat pork and we become infected. Of course we eat pork and we become infected with uh, trichinellar spiralis. Here they are, your nerve cell right here. One, two, three, four. These are the larval stage of the trichinellar spirals. So the larval stages of this parasite harm us, just like schistosoma. You remember the eggs harm us, not the adult. The adult of these organisms are sitting somewhere in the small intestine and they are not bothering us at all in any way or fashion. They're just copulating and putting out the eggs and the eggs are becoming the larva. Well, putting out the larva, sorry about that. They don't, they are viviparous. Okay, they don't put out eggs. They're viviparous. They put out the they, they put out the larva L1 
and the L1, one around in the body that goes to find the skeletal muscle, hoping sometime a carnivore comes, eats that meat, and then the life cycle goes on and on and on. Okay, so that's what the life cycle, here it is. We call it a uh, domestic life cycle between um, uh, pigs, mice, rats, and then of course we human eat pigs. And then this is called sylvatic cycle. I've been harping on it uh, a lot of time. Uh, there were two uh, explorers. They went to the North Pole and their balloon, um, and they died uh, of course, and all they could find uh, hunt a polar bear and they ate polar bear, and eventually they did not die of starvation, they died of trichinosis. Because the polar, they, they had nothing to cook it. So they were eating the polar bear raw, and what happened, these um, the, uh, trichinosis spiralis, they love diaphragm. They go to the diaphragm, and they multiply, and you eat, keep eating it, and the diaphragm becomes so heavy, so breathing cannot occur, and the person suffocates and dies. That's what happens. You get them in your arms and legs, all over the body, skeletal muscle. So um, that's what usually happens. As this, this diagram is showing you male and female are residing somewhere in the intestine and they're happy. They're not bothering us. It's just the law what they put out. Uh, so I, again, I like to talk about this for a long time, but quickly in Germany, what every pig that goes through slaughter, they take, they take a piece of diaphragm and they look at it on a microscope. In the United States, they take blood samples and they look for the antibody of it in the pigs. So that's why European countries, uh, they do not like to buy US pork. Uh, Germany is one of them. Uh, I don't know, I know Poland, uh, still gets U.S. port, but uh, not Germany. Um, those are the things that I have a little, my information is a little bit older now, you can look it up. Um, uh, so there are many, 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 many stories I have about this organism, the interesting organism. I hope uh, you study it. The next organism is Entrobius vermicularis. The common name is pinworm. So for the lab exam, you should know the um, common name and scientific name, hookworm, intestinal roundworm, pinworm, okay, um, and then we have a few more, it will come up. I do not have any uh, common name for enterobius, uh, for uh, trichinella spiralis, so if you find one, please let me know, I'm sure there is one, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I never came across it in my life. Maybe I did and I forgot. <laughs> okay, so pinworm, uh, they are um, they are very small, look like a pin, look like a pin, little or no disease. They cause little or no disease. And they live in large intestine and they have haplodiploidy, cross that off. God, over the years, I got rid of this term, but it keeps appearing in my notes. Um, that's not true. Male die after copulation, and that does not mean haplodiploidy. Okay, that does not mean haplodiploidy. So, may die after copulation, and what happens? Female die after oviposition. So, when male and female come together, the male dies after they separate, and then the female dies after they lay eggs. Why is that a myth? Why? What happens? What is so different about these organisms? Well, because these organisms, uh, enterobius pinworms in general, what happens? They do not have to live their host. The whole life cycle can be completed inside of their host. So um, that's why the adults die, so there is room or the young, they lay eggs. They lay eggs in the large intestine. And that's why uh, sometimes you see them in the feces. But most of the time, the female comes around the anus and lay eggs and then go back up and dies. Okay? Back up in the intestine and they die. And that's why 
if you're most likely little children, it was one study done, 101, one study was done, 100% of children in the United States have quinoa. So at night when they're asleep, you grab a clear tape, the kids are asleep. You grab a clear tape, scotch tape, and you go on their anus, okay? And bring it and put it on a microscope, you see the eggs. If you're suspicious that your kid is always itching, you know, most kids do that, but in nowadays, they're called constantly itching their butt. So maybe you can grab a scotch tape and go around their anus and put on the micro. Of course, you have to have a microscope and put on a microscope and you see the eggs that I'll show you some eggs that is one side flat and the other side is curved. Very unique type of egg, easy to uh, distinguish. And then it call it retro infection. Usually it caused because um, because the animal, the, you know, you studied that before, the sputum, we have the eggs in the sputum. You remember the long fluke? We had egg in urine. We have egg in feces. So the parasites always find a way to get out of their host in order to life goes on to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation. For thousands, millions of years, it's been like that. Okay, these guys, oh, why should I leave the horse? This is a nice place. We stay here. So when they stay there, too much of them, it can cause constipation. And retroinfection means the animal uh, complete the life cycle inside of their host. We do not have too many parasites like that, but this is one. And uh, tinea sodium, it becomes a larval stage. Uh, the eggs become a larval stage. Here are the eggs, here's a pinworm. As you can see, the posterior end of the animal is pointed and that's the anterior portion of the animal. This is the posterior portion of the animal. Here's a life cycle from CDC. Life cycle is direct. You know, you don't need it, uh, anything else. Here are the eggs, nice and beautiful. And here's a pinworm. And look at this, this is all eggs. Animal is filled with eggs. Again, I have a few stories to say about uh, 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 pinworm, but let's leave it to that. And then uh, uh, this is the last worm I want to mention. I'll come back to this again later on. Just hang on in, uh, uh, to nematodes. Uh, so this will be the last worm. Uh, Tricaris tricaris, uh, it's in Appalachian. It's not all over the United States, but it's very common in Appalachian. It's there in Appalachian mountains. Uh, and the common name is uh, whipworm. And the very first time the scientist, the Russian scientist who uh, discovered it, for example, this is the uh, worm and this is the worm. He, uh, if I would discover this organism first, I would say, well, evidently mouth is here and anus is here, right? That would make sense. However, after they've done more research on this animal, they said, no, mouth is here and anus is here. Look like a whip, right? That's what they call it, the whip worm. So cause little harm or uh, if numbers are low, uh, the eggs have operculum, uh, are operculated eggs, they have a flap, okay? Just like uh, Clinorchis sinensis, they had a flap, operculum. Here they are the eggs. So here is the operculum right here, those flaps open up. Here is the female. And he is a male, you can see that, uh, and look like a whip. You guys see that? Look like a whip. And uh, again, uh, here is a whip, and then uh, look like a whip, as I said. And uh, for a long time, they thought this end has the anus, and this end has the mouth, but that's not the case. This end has the anus, and this end has the mouth. Oh. If in, in heavy infections, if uh, the person has a lot of these in them, uh, as you can see some of the worms in here, it, it can cause prolapsed rectum. Uh, as I said, it usually does not cause any problem. The numbers are low, but then the person keeps eating the stuff is contaminated, the eggs, uh, vegetations, whatever have you. Again, people go out poop. And then when they poop, another person comes accidentally, uh, drink or eat whatever it is, contaminated in that poop, and then uh, we become infected with it. Okay, 
So the life cycle is direct, but through uh, E. Okay, um, let's stop here with flarial worms. I'll come back to this, uh, the next session of uh, nematodes, uh, and then uh, we'll take it from there. I wish uh, if it was the end of the class, I would ask, is there any question? Is there any, does anybody have any comments? But <laughs> I guess I'm used to it. Um, stop. Okay, guys, take care.